Good morning, everyone. You're listening to The Sci-Files, an exposure segment featuring Michigan State University student research. We're your co-hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. Today, we welcome Wen Cheng. Wen, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Wen Cheng, and I'm a PhD student in physiology. I study the uh, pancreatic beta cell, which is the cells that produce insulin, and uh, I study how the inflammation will affect the beta cell function and hope to find a way to treat type 1 diabetes. Can you please define what is insulin? So insulin is a molecule that is produced by uh, the pancreas. So inside the pancreas, there are uh, a lot of cell types. And there are these cell types called beta cell. And the beta cell will secrete this molecule, insulin, to help lower your blood sugar. So after a meal that you eat, uh, your blood sugar will rise. And then your, um, your body needs something to control the blood sugar because um, if you have too much sugar flowing around, it's not good for your body and it will increase the fat. And then therefore, insulin is necessary to control your blood sugar. And what is the main function of the pancreas? So the pancreas, there are two parts of the pancreas. It's called exocrine and endocrine. So exocrine means that uh, they secrete enzyme or bicarbonate. So these are necessary for digestion of the food. And the endocrine part is the part that they secrete hormones into the blood. So there are some hormones that the pancreas secrete. For example, insulin, as I mentioned before. The, the hormone with the opposite function of insulin is glucagon. So if insulin helps lower the blood sugar, gluco, glucagon will help raise the blood sugar. For example, when, you are, if, when you're hungry and when you don't have a lot of uh, food, so glucagon will help to break down the gly- glycogen in the liver, and then it will produce sugar to help maintain the um, homeostasis of your body. What type of pancreatic beta cell are you studying? Are you studying them from humans or a particular animal? So um, in my lab, because uh, it's easier to study the cell line, so we use this uh, red pancreatic cell line instead of uh, actual beta cell from human. So we have the primary cells, which is the cells taken from human or animals. Those are the most accurate model for studying the beta cell. However, they are more expensive and um, it's harder to get them. So we use this cell line called ing one cell, and we use that to do the uh, experiment in the lab to try to predict the response, and then hopefully it can be translated into the primary cells. What experiments do you all do to these cells? So we are interested in identifying the mechanism for type 1 diabetes. So the, in type 1 diabetes, these pancreatic beta cells are destroyed by the, the immune cells of our own body. And therefore, these cells produce cytokines. So these are small molecules that can destroy the beta cell. So we are interested in treating the beta cell with these cytokines and see how the beta cell react with these cytokines. Do you cause these cytokines to be produced by the cell or do you actually like add something to your cells? So we added recombinant cytokines to the beta cell and try to find the mechanism by which these cytokines call, cause the dysfunction of beta cell. And by doing that, then I'm, I'm assuming that you guys can figure out like, oh, if this cytokine is increased and if it causes these cells to break up or like if it's like the immune system attacking it, then you guys can kind of figure out what's going on with diabetes. So like if people are eating like a high fat diet, so it'll be like a increase of fatty acid. And if you see like, oh, this is increased, then you can kind of go backwards towards it, right? Yeah. Basically, um, so we are interested in looking at the mechanism, how these cytokines affect the lipid metabolism or the, the metabolism of the fat molecules in these beta cells so that we can identify the target so that we can um, choose the target and 
identify a new therapeutic approach to treat or to modify the cytokine's function in type 1 diabetes. And then really quickly, what is the difference between type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes? The most obvious uh, difference between type 1 and type 2 is to is whether the beta cells are intact or not. So for type 1 diabetes, it's also called juvenile diabetes because mostly people who are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes are children, and the onsets are usually around um, teenage or um, younger age. So in type 1 diabetes, the beta cells are attacked by the immune cells and because they have autoantibody, so they expose something and then that are mistaken by the immune cells as foreign factor, and they are destroyed by the immune cells. And therefore, these beta cells are destroyed, and therefore, they can produce insulin to control your blood sugar. In contrast to type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes are not uh, usually juvenile. It's usually... Um, correlates with metabolic syndrome, for example, obesity. So you can see a lot of people with obesity, they have type 2 diabetes as well. So in type 2 diabetes, the beta cells are not attacked by immune cells per se, um, but they are not sensitive to um, the change around them. So they can secret enough insulin or the insulin is losing the function to control the blood sugar. So that is the main difference between type 1 and type 2. With which type do people need to inject insulin into themselves? So because type 1 diabetes, you have loss of insulin and loss of beta cells, so you have to supply the insulin. So people with type 1 diabetes need to have insulin supply with the uh, injection or insulin pump. Uh, for type 2 diabetes, you don't need insulin in the beginning, but as the disease progresses, you will have to uh, have insulin um, besides the oral drugs. Is insulin the only thing that these uh, diabetic patients need, or are there other things that they need to do to uh, manage their quality of life? So we study type 1 diabetes, so um, I can tell more about type 1. So for type 1 you need insulin as like, it's a essential for your life. So if you don't have insulin, your blood sugar will be skyrocketed and it was super dangerous. Um, and it can cause a lot of complication in your eye and your feet and something else. Um, however, recent publication also show that for type 1 diabetic patients, you also need to exercise and watch out for your diet as well. So type 1 and type 2, although they are a little different, but the diet, the medication, and exercise are the main three pillars that you have to watch out to maintain your blood sugar and your quality of life. Is there a genetic aspect to your beta cell problem at all that you're looking at? I ask this because a lot of times doctors will ask whenever you're getting a checkup, oh, is there history of diabetes in your family? Which leads me to believe that there's some sort of genetic as aspect in there. Yes. Yeah, so between two types of diabetes, type 1 has more genetic um, aspect in it. So if you have a twin that has type 1 diabetes, it's likely that the other person will have type, two, type 1 diabetes as well. Um, and for type 2, it's less likely to have genetic um, aspect. It's more environmental and diet. For type 1, besides the genetic factor, you can also have virus infection. It is also something that scientists are trying to figure out the correlation between viral infection and uh, the onset of type 1 diabetes. And what virus has been found responsible to increase the onset of type 1 diabetes in the first place? So there are several strains of virus that are found to be, are found in the, um, the pancreas of diabetic people. And some of them are poliovirus, Coxsackie virus, and the most common one is the 
Kawasaki virus B3 strain. All right, and how does it induce diabetes? So my lab is also interested in the aspect of viral infection、uh, to beta cell. So these viral these virus once they attack the beta cells, they induce this viral response by the beta cells, and these beta cells will express the molecules, and these molecules somehow they will a- attract the immune cells by the body. And these immune cells will secrete the cytokines and other molecules that will destroy these beta cells. And therefore, viral infection is is one of the cause by、uh, by which the beta cells are a, a, attacked by the immune cell and cause the loss of beta cell and therefore losing the insulin secretion. Are you particularly working also on the a project with the viral infection? So we don't use virus per se. We use the、um, the molecule that is produced by the virus, which is the double stranded RNA, to mimic the viral infection. And we will see how those will affect the beta cell and how the cytokine treatment will change the response of beta cell to virus. It seems like there's a lot of different factors that you can look at. You can look at lipid metabolism, sugar production. You can look at what happens with the insulin and about also if the cells are living or dying. So, are you looking at all of these, or only or are you only focused on the cytokine aspect of it? I look at the combined effect of it. So, I looked at how cytokines affect the lipid metabolism in response to viral infection to beta cell. And how do you measure lipid metabolism? So we use this method. It's called lipidomics. So basically,、um, it will measure the specific molecules of lipid inside the cells. So first, you will har- harvest the cells and break them up, and then you will extract the lipid in the cells. After the lipids are diluted or are、um, dissolved in the solution. It will go through this machine. It's called mass spectrometer, and this machine it will define the lipids based on the mass of those molecules. And therefore, we will have a map of all the lipid molecules inside the cells, and we will see what is the change in the lipid com- composition in the beta cells after we infect the cells with virus. Which, in your laboratory's case, is the double-stranded RNA.、Mm-hmm. And then, how do you measure how much insulin is being produced by the beta cells during your experiments? So we use the beta cells to measure insulin secretion to two glucose condition. So the beta cells have the basal insulin secretion and the stimulated insulin secretion. So we measure at two concentration of glucose, the low concentration, which is. Two point eight millimolar glucose, which is a, around seventy five milligram per deciliter, which is the low blood glucose in the human, and also we measure insulin secretion in sixteen point eight millimolar glucose, which is super high、um, in human. So by comparing between these two conditions, we can measure how much insulin is produced by the beta cell in. The basal and the stimulated condition, and we use this、uh, assay to measure insulin、um, in the、um, secreted by the beta cell in the media. What are the common type one diabetes therapeutic techniques that exist out there right now, and how is your research helping to improve those techniques for di- type one diabetes patients? So currently, the only working therapeutic. Therapy right now for type one diabetes is to use the、uh, insulin. So it has been, if you if you have watched the news, it has been show that insulin price has been super high and people have cut out like the dose of insulin because they can't afford it. So the scientists have tried so many methods to replace the insulin need. So one of them could be to replace the pancreas. So you can have pancreas transplant. However, the transplant can also has a lot of complication because you have to have a matching pancreas between the donor and the、um, 
recipients. Another way to have more uh, accurate therapy is to transplant only the islet, which is the the clump of cells that produce insulin only instead of the whole pancreas. So that will reduce the possibility for the um, reactive response between donor and recipients. My research focuses on another type of therapy, which is anti-cytokine therapy. So as I mentioned before, these cytokines destroy the beta cells and therefore they are culprits for type 1 diabetes. So there are some research out there that are trying to target these cytokines by injecting something that can neutralize these cytokines and hopefully that they can reverse the effect of these cytokines on the beta cell. So my research, hopefully it can identify the mechanism of interferon gamma, which is a specific cytokine that I am interested in, and find a way or a target that can modulate the effect of interferon gamma on the beta cell so that we can preserve the beneficial effect of this cytokine but can twist the detrimental effect of this cytokine and hopefully it can make the beta cell protective from the detrimental effect of cytokines. Is there a particular reason why you chose to pursue diabetes type 1 research? So it's a funny story because my undergrad research, I study type 2 diabetes and I study um, like a, an analytical chemistry research. Uh, so I try to synthesize this resistant starch so that uh, it cannot be broken down too much or it, so it will be like slowly broken down and it doesn't cause too much glucose to be release after you eat. And therefore, I gained my interest in diabetes in general. Um, so as I um, transited into my PhD program at Michigan State University, University I found uh, Dr. Olson's um, research very interesting. Uh, she, he has a long history, um, a long record of experience in uh, beta cell and how the um, lipid and environmental insoles affect the beta cells in type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes. So that's why I joined his lab and um, that is when I uh, started to establish more uh, research in type 1 diabetes. Where did you conduct your undergraduate research in? So I came from Hue University of Medicine and Pharmacy. So it's a um, it's a university in um, Vietnam, so I got the Bachelor of Pharmacy there, and as a part of my undergraduate training, we had to do um, some research, and my thesis was to uh, synthesize the, the chemical resistant starch for type 2 diabetes patient. Okay, I didn't realize that you had come from Vietnam right before you started pursuing your PhD here at MSU. What was that transition like, making the move all the way across the world to here? And what has helped make that transition smooth for you? Definitely the weather is one of the biggest uh, change. So I came from a tropical country to Michigan, uh, which is super cold, <laughs> as you know. Um, so I'm, I was very uh, lucky to have um, a a lot of support right in the beginning so we we got uh, in touch with these professor from uh, MSU and they were very helpful in terms of introducing us to the new life and they picked us at the airport and um, help us with like the um, like settled down like for the first month so it was very nice so that is what that is very warming uh, welcome of the America to us, uh, to me in particular. Um, and besides the weather, I think Michigan has been very, um, I mean, it, it's a very nice state to experience. I like um, going to the nature and experience with the outside outdoor activity. So because it has four uh, season climate, so you can 
do a lot of activities all year round. So I think I Michigan has provided me a lot of experience in um yeah, during my PhD and I'm grateful for that. So I actually met Wynn before today. I know her from the Council of Graduate Students. Are you involved in anything else? So besides the Council of Graduate Students, I was actively involving in the Physiology Council of Students. So for the last for the last two years, I've been trying to uh, organize a lot of activities for the students and um, specifically academic related. Uh, so, for example, in my department, we have the compre comprehensive exam um, around the year three of the graduate of the um, graduate program. So, a lot of these students they they are very nervous in terms of like presenting their present um, their oral presentation before the actual day. So, I help organize the practice talks for them and. Um, they have they have benefited a lot from that because the audiences are graduate students, so we raise the questions that the committee members are not actually giving, and it brings some new aspect to the graduates to the person who's doing the comprehensive exam. That's wonderful. I believe that a lot of graduate students really do need that experience. It's really good to practice, especially whenever it's such a long talk in front of people. Yeah, I agree. I remember just a couple weeks ago, I had to give my oral presentation for my committee. Uh, but now here I am as a PhD candidate in the graduate school. But thank you so much, Wynn, for coming in this morning to taking the time to talk about your research in type 1 diabetes. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, I'm very glad that I have the chance to share with you guys about science in general and diabetes in particular. Thank you to all of our listeners that joined us this week. And remember, the truth is in the science. Any comments and questions can be directed to scifiles at impact89fm.org. We'll see you all next week on SciFiles.